Yeah, we have the digital revolution still in full swing and yet the next technological revolution is already happening and it's much closer to us as individuals, even to our own bodies, the biotechnological revolution. Biotechnology, the word itself is a synthesis, what a complicated English word, <laughs> uh, of biology and technology and therefore naturally it fits perfectly with the motto of our conference this year, which is Synthese, which in German is a much easier word. Well, recent breakthroughs in biotech are, of course, raising hopes. Uh, we will soon be able to cure diseases we couldn't cure so far. Uh, we can also live longer, maybe healthier, maybe um, very long. Uh, that's a great progress, right? But then it also raises the questions, do we actually want to live forever? Do we actually want to optimize us on a genetic level? Um, th these are the questions. We are very happy to have the three guests for today and be tackling them. Yes, we have three great experts to uh, answer not only scientific questions, but also ethical questions. And uh, I'm very uh, thrilled to uh, um, introduce Wolfgang Nellen to, uh, to you, not only because he has such a great uh, first name. We have three Wolfgangs this year on this stage, <laughs> on this very stage. Um, <laughs> it's genetic, yeah. He's, he's a, a 1 in 9 member, but most of all, he was a professor for genetics at Kassel University until 2015. He was the president of the German Genetics Society and the German Biologist Society. He did a lot of other great stuff. Let me just mention this one. In 1996, he founded Science Bridge. That's an association dedicated to the science communication for schools and the general public, even to politicians. I know that with a focus on CRISPR. Hi Wolfgang, great to have you here. We also have Marianne Martens with us, who is a scientist, but now is a partner at Apollo Health Ventures, which is a venture capital firm. You invest and build companies which actually use technology to work on drugs, which kind of tackle the age-related um, age related diseases. Uh, so we're very, uh, very happy to have you here. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And live from Finland, we should have another guest. Um, we are connected to Emilia Tika. Let us see Emilia. Hello, from hello everyone. Yeah, happy to join you. Uh, Perfect. Digitally. <laughs> uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't see you. Uh, Emilia is a transdisciplinary designer and researcher, currently a PhD candidate at Aalto University. Her work explores philosophical dimensions and cultural implications of novel genome editing technology like CRISPR and she's also um, done an uh, artistic work that um, talk, uh, deals with uh, longevity. So we have also an artist perspective. That's why we're very happy to have you with us, Emilia. Thank you. <laughs> a discussion with three lightning talks from our three speakers where we will be given deeper insights in their work and they, their thoughts. What I want to do is uh, give you some kind of perspective on, uh, on CRISPR-Cas. I guess most uh, uh, of the uh, listeners, viewers are familiar with the expression CRISPR-Cas is gene technology. It's a, um, a tool uh, to change genes. Um, I give you a little bit of perspective uh, what this tool does of course you can a tool you can use for uh, all kinds of things for nasty things for good things um, what I've listed on the slide just to keep that in the background so you can always look at it it's all the, the nice things you can do I'm not going to talk about the nasty things um, <laughs> we, you can do that later <laughs> yeah you can ask me nasty questions um, Okay, what I would like to remind you of, uh, CRISPR-Cas, like all, essentially all the other uh, gene technology, are kind of uh, uh, reproducing uh, mechanisms that occur in nature. And uh, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, we've been using natural uh, uh, mechanisms for about 10,000 years, maybe more, uh, to improve the needs, uh, to improve animals, plants, microbes, and humans uh, to our needs. Plants and animals, well, obviously agriculture, microbes, yes, of course, beer. Yeast has been selected 
improved for beer brewing, for baking and for whatever. And humans, uh, are we breeding, selecting humans? Yes, of course. Think of the Indian castes, think of uh, noble bloodlines in Europe, uh, think of uh, eugenic programs like uh, uh, Dor Yeshorim uh, that are running right now. And it's kind of selective breeding. Uh, okay, so these are the natural things that we've been using. Nature is doing all these uh, different uh, techniques, but nature has unlimited time uh, to play around with genomes. And nature does this uh, with incredible collateral damage. Uh, most people are not really aware of that. Uh, breeding is not extremely successful in nature. Some animals produce hundreds of thousands of offspring and only one or two survive. So there is incredible collateral damage. Uh, with the gene technology, we will also have collateral damage, no problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is decreased in comparison to nature. And most people are not really aware of that. Um, Okay, uh, this also includes, don't forget that, it's not only working on the structure, the sequence of genes, it's also shuffling around genes and it's shuffling genes from one organism to the other, which also occurs in nature. It happens that genes are transferred from one organism uh, to the other more or less successfully. Um, let me just check. Uh, so, what we can do with CRISPR is, and with other uh, technologies, is uh, faster and it is, to say the truth, less dangerous, uh, um, does less damage than what nature usually does. So what are the, uh, the, the fields of application? Uh, look at the, at the screen. I've listed them. We can discuss uh, several items uh, or points that you are interested on uh, later. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is um, the human germline. And I guess this or the somatic editing single cells or the germline. Uh, these are topics that we may address in, in uh, your talk. Um, what I would like to point out in, in that respect is something that I find amazing. We had three years ago an incredible discussion on ethics of human germline um, changes, editing. It's all forgotten now. Nobody is talking about it anymore. Right? We are. Mm -hmm. hmm? We are now. We we, we are now. <laughs> uh, does anybody know what of what happened of the three children that He Jiang Kui edited three years ago? The only thing I know is that they are three years old now. And there's no scientist, there is no investigative journalist, there's nobody asking or doing investigation what these children are doing. And uh, yes, I'm sure they are not the only children, at least in other countries. I'm pretty sure about Russia. I'm fairly sure about US, maybe other countries. Uh, China, of course, they are working on it and we are having a problem not knowing. I don't think that uh, uh, somatic or uh, um, germline editing is bad in itself. But I think it's amazing that we don't know what people are doing, what scientists are doing, and that nobody appears to be interested about it. Uh, other fields of CRISPR-Cas, 
just briefly on the side, we'll come, into the, come to that in the discussion, uh, is of, co of course the agricultural aspect that is what is mostly in the discussion. Um, yes, it is a discussion and what we are doing in Germany and here we had optimistic views in the last uh, uh, talks, in the last panels, uh, here I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic. Uh, what we do in Germany is, uh, for ethical reasons, we are doing the most unethical thing uh, that you can imagine. Uh, we are pulling out of the technology. Uh, we want to be clean, we want to be ethical, and that's why we say we don't do anything um, about this, but that kicks us out of the discussion, and I hope that may be uh, one point for questions, for discussions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Yeah, that you raised a lot of questions that we're going to uh, uh, answer later or try to answer, which is not so easy. You can just leave it on. Um, now, from this view on CRISPR, and um, let's talk about the fight against age-related diseases. That's another field where there's a lot of, uh, going on in, in biotech. That's the field you're working on, Marianne. So we are pretty uh, excited about what you're going to tell us. Yeah, happy to do so. I, yeah, if you could give me the switch, that would be good. So, uh, thanks a lot for having me here today. Um, as, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm a partner at Apollo Health Ventures, and um, Apollo is a, is a venture capital firm that creates and that invests into companies focusing on the biology of aging. And why are we so interested in the biology of aging? Um, this is actually the reason, because aging is the primary and main risk factor for a, a range of different chronic diseases, like uh, heart disease, like cancer, uh, like dementia. And um, it's, it's, it's really a striking uh, increase of, of prevalence in, in the last decades. One of 10 uh, individuals aged 65 and older suffer from Alzheimer, and the prevalence is even increasing uh, with increasing age. And um, those diseases usually progress in a very irreversible manner, leading to a really decreased quality of life, uh, leading to death sooner or later. And uh, it's not only the personal costs, it's also an economic burden uh, to society as um, healthcare expenditures triple uh, for, for individuals older than 65 and are even seven times uh, higher for um, individuals uh, aged 80 and older. So it's a, a large burden we have here. And um, so far, uh, most of the chronic diseases, most of the age-related diseases are uh, treated um, fairly late in the disease progression and the uh, progression of pathology once there's already uh, serious damage to the tissue, to the organs, and uh, once there's really irreversible uh, damage to, um, to the system. And um, diseases at this stage um, are very difficult to treat. So usually there are only a few um, more or less effective treatments available. Um, treatments uh, focusing on, on treating symptoms and at the best case are able to uh, um, to halt the, the disease progression and um, uh, preserve organ function for a few more years um, but um, it's it's a very uh, serious state already and at Apollo we try really to target uh, the root causes of disease, uh, of age-related disease, of chronic diseases, on a cellular, on a molecular, and on a tissue level. And um, by utilizing really the combined knowledge and uh, the advancements um, on, on the biology of aging, on all the research on the pathways, and also utilizing uh, new enabling technologies, um, for example, uh, the CRISPR technology, but also uh, other tools and, um, and enabling technologies, for example, as we saw in, in the last talk, um, single cell analysis, uh, we really try to, um, to target and understand uh, the processes which lead to dysfunction in the first place, 
very early uh, on in the uh, in the progress. And with this, we we hope to extend uh, human health span, and uh, really try to combat um, age-related age diseases in an early stage. Thanks. Thanks. Th thank you. Now we heard uh, the position of scientists, scientists turned investors, and now we would like to hear what an artist uh, has uh, to say about genetic, uh, genetic engineering and CRISPR. Emilia, over to you. Okay, great. Let me uh, share my screen. So, can you can you see the screen now? Not yet, but I guess uh, maybe our uh, regie has has the slides. Oh, there they are. Now we see it. We we, we have you the, we have okay. you and the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're used to used to these questions nowadays. Okay, perfect. So yes, I'm very excited to be part of this uh, panel as well, and, and very interesting points came out already. But let me uh, give you a quick uh, insight of, of my work as an artist and designer, and I will start with some questions. So regarding the first slide, um, what if human psyche could be enhanced with a genome editing? What if one parent biological child would be possible? What if physical aging could be stopped? And these were all uh, my uh, previous works and, and questions I've been interested in in the field of, of speculative design. So speculative design is an approach where design is used as a tool to research about complex societal and ethical questions of novel technologies before they become applications. The yet non-existent technological applications are made tangible and domesticated through design, film and photography. The designs are often placed in a world that resembles the present day rather than a distant future in order to bring the issues closer to the everyday life. The works go beyond simplistic utopia and dystopia and rather place the questions in the complexities of the real life. The aim is not to explain science but rather to widen the range of questions and perspectives around novel biotechnologies and diversify the talk around technological futures in general. Since our topic today is the human longevity, I will give you a quick insight on my work ION. In 2018, I decided to speculate around the question what if one day we could stop aging? What kind of societal implications might follow? With this project, I was selected as an artist in residence for a three-month laboratory residency at the Max Delbruck Center for Monaco and Medicine in Berlin, organized by State Art and Science Agency. And within this residency, uh, the speculation of the work uh, took place in three different stages. So first, uh, working in the laboratory, I was interested in how could stopping aging actually happen scientifically, if it would be possible. Through Yamanaka's innovation, stem cell laboratories are able to turn adult cells into embryonic cells by activating certain genes. As a non-scientist, this turning an aged adult cell back to embryonic cell sounded to me quite like turning back the aging clock. It turned out that I was not the only one who thought so, since there was actually a scientist who has done this kind of experiments with mice and published also paper in Cell. But as a speculative experiment with the scientists, we use CRISPR, DCAS, 
mind system to constantly activate these clock genes in human cells, not all the way back to embryo, but just enough to turn the clock backwards. To make this speculation tangible and bring it into a dimension of everyday material world, I designed the technology as a fictional consumer product, an inhaler that could be used to stop aging. And these little bottles you see, they are the components that we also used for the, for the laboratory experiment. To explore more of the societal implications of this yet non-existent technology, I created a story around the inhaler. Who would actually use it? And even more interestingly, who would not use it? The story is told um, as 11 photographs. It illustrates a couple living in a world where stopping aging is possible. They, however, have made the opposite decisions to use the technology. They both are in their 80s, but only the woman wanted to live through the physical aging. The aim of this speculation is not to predict future. It is rather to generate questions also relevant today, such as are different stages of aging an experience that actually makes us human? Is there such a thing as a natural lifespan? What is a good life now and what could it be in the future? And as the final words, I want to say, um, since the future is not something fixed, I believe that it's important to explore possibilities and ask questions of biomedical technologies that are not there yet. And the aim of my very new work is to move towards including more diverse perspectives on what desirable future could mean to different people. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Emilia. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to jump in on this uh, speculative design versus what's happening right now. Maya and Emilia created an artwork that uh, shows a future where it's possible to stop aging and people could just decide to inhale something and stop aging. Now you are working on what's going on in fighting age-related related diseases right now. So maybe what's ahead in the, in the next years in fighting aging and what might still be some kind of a topic for more speculative approach. Yeah, I think we, um, we get more and more the tools to combat um, uh, age-related diseases uh, in an earlier um, stage. This is what I mentioned in my talk. So I think diagnostic techniques um, are getting better and better. So we will um, see the, the diseases really early on in the progress. I think we will also be able um, to um, design treatments and tailor treatments uh, better to specific patient groups um, by sophisticated biomarker strategies, um, by using AI-assisted um, single-cell analysis. Um, so there, there are different tools in the development that makes uh, it possible to treat earlier, more specific. We know more about biology. We can really rationally design drugs and treatments uh, so that, that we have less uh, side effects and higher potency. So I think this is a way we are really getting there and hopefully we, we will then be able to really extend a human health span. Um, what I'm honestly not a, a true believer in is um, that we are going to find the one uh, gene of aging or aging gene and um, maybe knock it off via CRISPR and then everybody lives longer for 30, 40 years uh, or, or, or however long. So I think this is a more uh, a topic, I think, for the more distant uh, future, although one has to say that already in, in, um, uh, in animal models like uh, Drosophila or the C. elegans, um, researchers have discovered these aging genes, um, but it appeared to be really difficult to translate it even to a little higher uh, animals like mice and uh, in humans. It's just like uh, there's so far uh, no proof of concept, I guess. So um, 
I think there are studies going on really narrowing down the gene, uh, the gene loci uh, of, of the genes of aging. Um, but I think we are, we are not yet there to really say um, there's one intervention uh, which really extends dramatically the lifespan. So I think this is a bit more like for the more distant future. The um, reality check with you also, Wolfgang, maybe, uh, thanks Marianne, maybe uh, you could let us know what, what's possible with CRISPR now, what is, how is CRISPR and other genome editing technologies already used now, maybe some concrete use cases, and what is more a vision for the future? Okay, it's, uh, it's definitely being used in, uh, in farming, in plants. There are a lot of things uh, being developed. Some things are in the pipeline, but there will be a lot of stuff uh, in the fields, not in Europe, but in other countries. Um, in terms of uh, uh, human health, well, let's just go to, to material science. Yes, there will be a lot of stuff, food, uh, we had discussions on, on food before. Uh, I guess that uh, microorganisms producing food may really be the future. Uh, food or food components. Uh, I just remind you, maybe it's been forgotten, it was in two 2014, I guess, uh, that a company developed from, um, at that time not CRISPR, uh, manipulated uh, microalgae palm oil. Uh, it was stopped by a group of NGOs because it was gene technology, so it was not allowed. But it's a, it's a food component or component for many other uh, applications that can be made by microorganisms, and I think there is uh, something for the future. Um, what else? Material... Um, Spider silk is a fantastic material. Uh, glues from um, silkworms, for example. Um, lots of stuff. I guess there are things going to come up. Uh, in uh, human medicine, I guess there will be a lot of diagnostics based on CRISPR. Most people are not aware of that. Uh, that there is actually a COVID test based on CRISPR-Cas. I'm surprised that it's not on the market in, in Germany, but they, it, it looks, it seems to be very efficient, very good. Uh, so there will be diagnostics, there will be, uh, there are, there is progress in medical treatments by somatic gene editing. And uh, I mentioned a little bit my concerns about germline editing. This is... Could just briefly explain the difference between somatic gene editing and okay. germline germ uh, editing? So somatic gene editing is uh, mostly, the pilot experiments are mostly done on blood diseases, but also on blindness. Uh, that means you have an adult person who uh, suffers from a certain disease and uh, you treat a certain cell type, like blood progenitor cells uh, or cells in the back of the eye uh, with CRISPR-Cas to repair uh, the defect. In germline editing, you're dealing with embryos. So somatic editing is not heritable, germline editing is. So you're dealing with embryos, uh, and you change the genome of an embryo to what you want, uh, and uh, the child is going to live with that change if it wants or if it doesn't want, doesn't matter. Um, it's been done, you can't reverse it, or it's very difficult to reverse it. Uh, but these things are going to be done, and as I said, it has been done in China, and apparently nobody cares anymore. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks. Um, thank you. I want to kind of follow up on the one part you already mentioned a couple of times, the communication, because, you know, if you talk about curing uncurable deadly diseases or optimizing us as humans, communications plays an enormous role, right? Because you can raise hopes, but you can also raise fears. 
and that could be also everything for you know for nothing so what's the best way to communicate and do you think it's done in the right way today because you know there are some billionaires who are already out there talking about living forever um, would you mind or media maybe yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, as I as I was talking about the, the speculative design, I think speculative and science, com science communication has a, like a slightly different aims. But, uh, but I guess what I can say about my work is that it always when it comes to new technologies and when it's just out there, we see this kind of hype and horror scenarios in the in the media and Naya, as Wolfgang just mentions maybe maybe <laughs> at the moment nobody's interested of gene anything but that used to be when the uh, when the he young Kuai case came out for example but I guess um, in my work I'm also not so interested of the hype or, or horror or utopia and dystopia scenarios that we also see in the science fiction films and so on and I'm more interested about um, sort of um, complexity. So and and also like what could this actually really mean when when the technology would land in the in the everyday life? And I think my uh, my works are kind of stories that don't really indicate that this is good or this is bad it's uh, my work is more about um, generating questions that that are maybe not asked at the moment and and kind of visualize something that uh, might not be seen so kind of trying to go beyond this uh, the first things that come to your mind and and, and also trying to go beyond this this um, hype and horror uh, division let's say I guess this would be my my take on this. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, it's a really interesting question, uh, honestly speaking, because um, I think even scientists and researchers sometimes get carried away when they have an, uh, when they discovered something new. There's uh, like Im like almost immediately a huge hype on the potentials on the potential impacts uh, this discovery could have. So um, I just recall like um, uh, first time researchers were able to um, grow uh, human tissue in a Petri dish. Then um, uh, a few months later, the, even also the scientific press was full of stories how we can uh, grow organs soon and how we can um, really tackle the transplant uh, crisis and transplant shortage. So, um, and looks, I mean, this was like in the late 80s and uh, look where we're standing right now. So I think it's, uh, there are really great progresses, but, um, and this I also liked on, on, on the discussion um, earlier this evening, um, it's in the end it's deep tech and it's biotech and uh, you need to be aware that biological uh, systems are uh, really extremely complex and that it might take a long time to really um, generate a product, uh, create a product out of an interesting discovery. This uh, just takes a lot of time to really have a safe treatment, have a safe drug. And uh, I think you have to be realistic also in communication. Um, there, I think there are some uh, really uh, promising developments, in, in, as I pointed out, in a lot of different um, fields now in, in biotech. And uh, you can see how powerful biotech is, um, uh, last but not least with the uh, COVID uh, vaccine. But um, it must be clear that it, it might just take a long time until we are really there. And this needs to be uh, also communicated, I think, to the outside world. and. Uh, also, researchers, scientists uh, have to be a bit careful what they really uh, communicate to uh, to society to not really um, create too too much hopes that it will uh, happen soon or that we soon can live forever. I think that's not the right way to go. Wolfgang, you you are active in science communication, so your take on this will be interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with you, um, but when something comes out of science and goes to the media, it immediately has a bias. 
it go it's either terrible or it's absolutely excellent and uh, this is uh, what i how i understand emilia's um, work she just leaves the viewer alone you're telling a story uh, but you don't give the answer and this i if if i get this right this is an excellent way to draw attention to people who are not primarily interested in science. And this is the important audience that we need. Uh, that's a majority. And you can attract people by this, and then they may be interested in a discussion, and then you can actually do what you say, uh, explain that it takes long, but that we have to start thinking about it right now. Yeah, uh, it's, we, when we have the facts, then there is not much of a decision left. When it's done, it's done. Uh, so we have to do it before, and how to attract the, um, uh, the interest of people, the majority of people is not extremely interested in details on science, but maybe you can get them. Uh, just to add on, there is at the moment a lot of money in science communication in Germany. In my opinion, it's not going where it has to go. I like... Hmm? It should go to 1 in 9. Uh, for example, yeah. No, but I like to have it for street workers, for people who go out to meet the public, to talk to people, to try to attract attention for science, you can't. It doesn't. It's not enough to invite them to a university to come to a lecture hall. They don't come. It's not enough to write concepts and position papers and uh, shuffle more and more paper around on the table. You have to get them by artwork, by science cafes, by going into the supermarket, and there's no money for the street workers. That I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we, we do have people who are interested in scientific details, I, I guess, we have to, because Christiane has questions from the audience. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of que questions, actually. I'm going to start uh, with the highest rated one. It's a question to Professor Nellen. Do you think Germany should be more active in the field of gene editing? Um. Up to now, basic research in uh, Germany is still good. Uh, no question about it. Um, can always be better, but we are. There's a lot of work being done in in uh, terms of that. The problem is uh, applications. Uh, essentially, applications in the most important f uh, field, that's agrobiotechnology, uh, is prohibited in Germany which means uh, people working on that are moving out of the country, industry is moving out of the country, uh, and we are talking about ethics, but we, nobody listens to somebody work, uh, uh, talking about ethics when they are not involved in the technology, or they reject the technology in the first place. So I believe the problem we have in Germany or all over Europe is the very restrictive uh, political way to deal with uh, CRISPR-Cas. Thanks for that. And maybe another question, Cassiana? Yes, there's one um, question that uh, goes like this. Uh, looking at the tools like CRISPR-Cas9, um, there are already people who fear that these tools could be used to create bioweapons that kill specific people or specific races of people. Is this just a fear mongering or is it a real threat? It was always me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Um, these fears are there. Uh, the great advantage is uh, that people are too diverse to uh, aim a weapon at a certain uh, ethnic group or a certain population. Uh, 
And the development of such weapons, I believe, is way too dangerous. And uh, I don't think anybody is really interested in that. I may be wrong. There are certainly uh, people working on bioweapons. Um, I, I can just give you an example, which is kind of funny. Um, many years ago, uh, people were working on a bioweapon aimed at people who are lactose intolerant. That was the most humane weapon you could think about. Uh, the idea was Asian people, uh, most Asian people are lactose intolerant. So if you fly into this country and you drop lactose, you will block the army because everybody will be sitting on the loo. They are not going to die. They just have terrible diarrhea and they can't fight. So that was the best weapon I could think of if you want biological weapons. <laughs> All the other weapons uh, are extremely dangerous for the people who are producing them. I don't think it's worth doing it, but I may be wrong. But maybe, you know, kind of as an opposite to killing uh, of people with biological um, weapons. Let's talk about really living longer and healthier. What does it actually mean for us as an individual, also for us as a society? What happens if we are all going to live on average until 100 years? Well, yeah, um, I mean, this comes around again with the question what uh, what is happening right now and if you look at society right now a, a lot of uh, old people suffer from age-related disease and what does this mean it's a, a decreased quality of life um, people uh, are restricted in their working capacity um, the functional restriction leads often to depression um, so like I think um, really aging healthy and actively, yeah, what I what this, is, if we are this is really like what we should aim for yeah. and what we should really look for. And I think it's for both, um, it would really mean like for, for on a personal level, uh, it would uh, mean that uh, everybody can just enjoy uh, life longer. Um, and uh, for society, it also means uh, we can save a lot of health expenditures, as, uh, for example, uh, all the costs associated with age-related disease uh, could be avoided. So I think this is really a win-win. Um, now, when it comes to um, socio-economic consequences, if uh, everybody would live longer, but society would uh, need to spend less money on each individual, um, it wouldn't matter if, if people would uh, live 10, 20 years longer because you just have to spend less money on each individual. So this is a little bit the hypothesis because often what we hear is, of course, if you live longer, um, this, this would uh, mean uh, costs increases and no society could really uh, tackle this. Um, I think it's the other way around, right? Uh, we actually um, we, we, uh, kind of decrease the burden for society. Uh, when we try to really push age-related diseases uh, to a minimum. And um, this, I think, is really a win-win for both, like pers on a personal level and for society. What about overpopulation? Well, I think that that is not so much of a problem as uh, I think um, at the moment we are more like in a um, need of, of working capacity in earlier days, right? So um, this there needs to be strategies, of course, if, if we have less young people and uh, but more older, more active people, then you could also extend this um, working span a bit longer. So I think there would be like on, on a society level, there would be uh, ways to adapt. Um, I think the um, the economic benefit is, is much larger or m much more prominent than the risk you have. Emilia, maybe uh, you could add to this because you made this artwork and confronted people with the um, idea of having a, you know, med medicine for staying young kind of forever. How did people react? What were their thoughts about it? Did they think that's cool? I, I want to have this or what was the reaction? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a quite a different question to say, like, we, let's, uh, we live healthier 
couple of years longer than that we would completely stop aging <laughs> but, but of course like around my work all, all different angles has been uh, discussed and I think mostly of course people see it uh, quite positive uh, especially to to live healthier uh, healthier and longer lives but when it comes to the question whether you would like to stop uh, aging or sort of remain uh, physically in certain age then people's opinions are quite uh, quite divided because some people some people say that as I also indicated in my talk that these different stages in human life uh, like a different ages are kind of what what makes us human and, and therefore some people wanted this kind of a diversity in, in life that you experience life through different stages of, of aging. But of course, some people then found it extremely desirable to look like 25 for the, for the, for the rest of their lives. So it's, uh, uh, it really divided people on, on what, what they thought. But of course, you could also then think about societal uh, implications of that, that what happens if, if you cannot tell from person's appearance how, how old the person is or what is kind of the life experience of a person and and uh, how would this change in societal level where age plays a role in how we um, how we kind of uh, think of uh, think of people but I think it's a quite a different question to talk about uh, immortality or stopping aging or or healthy healthy uh, longer lives but um, but as, as 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 Wolfgang said, this work was really opening uh, opening a lot of questions, and I and I realized myself also uh, being exhibiting this work in many places that that uh, that uh, that these questions are really interesting uh, for for people, and and there might be kind of an unexpected uh, answers as well. What what people find desirable. Thanks. I, I wanted to uh, forward, um, follow on to something that y y like you both combined said. You said that biotech research takes a lot of time. It might take decades till something that's already announced in the media actually happens. And you said as soon as we know that something's possible, we should at least start the discussion about it, uh, the societal discussion. So that leads me to the uh, discussion that started when the CRISPR babies so-called CRISPR babies in, in China were, were born uh, that have been um, made are said to be immune to HIV through genetic engineering. Um, so what are the questions that we should ask and answer now like really regarding CRISPR for example for of humans of human genomes and even if we answer them does it make any difference um, or will it happen anyway? So. Maybe you, you start, Wolfgang, and then you feel free to add. I think uh, we can uh, discuss it. It doesn't make any difference anyway. That's my, that's, that's my opinion. Uh, sorry, this is provocative, I know. Um, but uh, I guess the only thing we can do is to try to set up global rules for technical safety. All the other decisions are moral, ethical decisions. And there's another problem. We believe that our Western ethics are the standard, and they are the only ones, and they are the best. No doubt, no discussion. Go away, we are the best. Essentially, this is colonialism, what we are doing. We are implementing our ethics on other people. And we can't keep others from doing that. Just think, let me just remind you, think of the stem cell discussion. We are not allowed in Germany for ethical reasons to make human embryo embryonic stem cells but we are allowed to import them amazingly from Israel. I think this is something strange. 
I don't want to go into more detail what you can make out of this. The simple reason Jewish people have different uh, feeling on the beginning of life. And that's their right to have this. Our ethics on the beginning of life are not the standard, and you have this for many, many other things. And when it comes to editing the germline, you will find different opinions in different societies. And we can change that. We cannot be everywhere as missionaries of uh, Western European ethics. So thanks for that. Marianne, maybe you want to yeah, add your I, point I kind of, of agree. I think it's important that uh, every society has uh, its own like ethical framework. And uh, I don't see the point really um, or the reason why we have to take this uh, topic globally. So. I think what is important uh, is, of course, uh, that the regulatory framework is really fact-based and that is, is that that is really up to date. I mean, uh, like the CRISPR uh, regulatory framework is, I think, a, a good example that it's not adapted to recent findings uh, and it's not up to date in that sense that um, there's more like a dogmatic um, restriction to it. And uh, this, of course, is, uh, is prohibiting research, and this makes uh, maybe good researchers go rather to the US than staying here in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I think, in general, it's OK that Europe has its own um, ethical standards, rules, etc. Um, we don't have to follow uh, necessarily uh, other nations, as, as you said. I think this is really should be made up by the society. Um, but of course, I think we have to um, be cautious that we are not uh, really putting too m many hurdles on, on um, scientific progress. And here I think we have to be a bit more flexible and really um, challenge the rules uh, with all the findings, all the d discoveries from all over the world uh, and adapt it from time to time. It's not true, uh, as, as you said, CRISPR, uh, is, uh, gene editing is a safer way than um, breeding. But uh, as soon as you mention CRISPR in any like scientific uh, context, then um, regulatory um, um, the regulatory framework is just like is blowing up, and you have to do a lot of things uh, and uh, jumping uh, through um, burning loops as a scientist to get approval for something. So, in some regards, it's just a bit crooked, and this needs to be fi fixed. I think. Emilia, maybe you want to add to this point. Like this question? Yeah, I can add something. Yeah, because my work kind of uh, like talking about the enhancement or the or the optimization. I think my all my works kind of deal with this question in uh, in in different angles and and also what I what I learned by being exhibiting the works in different um, parts of the world. It was obvious that in in different cultures or or just by different peoples either. What is enhancement in <laughs> in in a, in a very different way? So it's a, it is kind of almost impossible to 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 kind of tackle that and and therefore um, I can say from my new work that I'm very interested of um, sort of taking this idea of an, an enhancement and try to look at it from from uh, from a very uh, a different angle. And uh, I, I also try to step out of the, the Western ideas, as Wolfgang was, was discussing through my uh, collaboration um, at the moment. And um, I'm, I'm working on something where I collaborate with the uh, indigenous reindeer herder and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and therefore uh, look at very different uh, different perspective uh, on on the topic. Uh, like one idea that we are working on is uh, kind of uh, to use genome editing as as a something to to bring back uh, lost uh, memories, for example. So uh, just to just to conclude that I'm uh, at the moment very interested to 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 look at this idea of uh, optimization and enhancement from kind of a very different uh, angle. 
to the to the usual discussion of what it might mean. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we can sum up that there is a lot of hope, lots of fears. So the final question to all three of you would be, what is your biggest hope? Or what is your biggest concern in the context of our discussion? Maybe Marianne, to start with you. Yeah, my, my biggest hope is that we can combat um, age-related diseases and really extend a human health span. Um, my biggest fear is that uh, therapies might be restricted to a smaller group of people um, so I think there need to be improvement and reimbursement uh, also when it comes to preventive or um, secondary preventive treatments um, and my fear is a little bit that people might think there will be a magic pill uh, that you can just take and uh, live longer or live forever um, so I think um, this this will be not the case and um, people just also have to keep in mind that um, it will be always a combination of several things to, to live long and uh, healthy, um, not to mention like eat healthy, <laughs> get a lot of exercise, etc. There are a lot of things you could do, could do today and tomorrow to, to stay healthy. Um, but I think we are on a good way really also to, um, uh, to fight those uh, really devastating uh, diseases we have at the moment. Thank you. In the way, my, my biggest hope, like having the pill and then don't, don't having to pay attention to e food and sports. But anyway. Yeah, I think that's the driver for a lot of uh, <laughs> our health. <That's> well. <laughs> Thank you. Emilia, what do you think? What's your biggest hope and what's your biggest concern? Yeah, I guess... Uh, I'm I, I'm concerned about the about the germline editing, so I think that's that's something that I am I I am um, concerned about, but also kind of a um, lack of diversity, like decreasing diversity, or like kind of a one-sided idea of of uh, of optimization, or like or just what is human or what humans should be, let's say. And for the for the hope, of course. Um, um, yeah, probably also like a health uh, related that some fatal genetic diseases where somebody dies in in an instant would be would be uh, would be cured. I also have some people close to me who who have uh, some genetic diseases that I would hope that would be would be tackled. So let's say that's that's my take. Thank you. Thank you for that, Wolfgang. Over to you. Yeah, I can only agree. <laughs> so, uh, I guess we are on a good way. Not tomorrow, not in two or three weeks. It will take a little bit longer, but there are good, really good uh, and justified hopes to tackle genetic diseases um, by, or, or also other diseases by, um, uh, somatic changes by, uh, especially for blood diseases, this is uh, almost there. It will not be for everybody. Not yet. I think this is one point one should also add. The rich countries are the, in the advantage that they will first get the, the treatment, but they are also serving as guinea pigs. Uh, so when when it's becoming a routine, then the poor countries get the approved medications. Uh, so there's a good side and there's a bad side on it. Um, so the hopes are that, the hopes are also that uh, Europe comes back to this technology, not only in basic research. Uh, the fears is that, yeah, also germline editing. Uh, I don't think it's, it's bad in itself. It has to be discussed. And I'm, I mean, I'm talking about optimization, not curing diseases. For that, germline editing is not necessary. We don't need this. Um, germline editing, when it's not being made transparent, the aims what are we going to edit? Who should be edited for what purpose? This has to be communicated transparently. 
And I'm afraid this is not going to happen. And I'm really afraid of that, that there is a lack of transparency and that it's being done um, yeah, behind the back. Thanks a lot, you guys, for this fascinating discussion on a very difficult topic. And but I hope we brought some some light into the dark. And we ended on a dark note, but we all also focus on the, the many opportunities that this technology is give. Thanks, guys.